first saw Donnie Brook at a post-production studio in LA a few months ago, and I was all alone. Uh, you'll be glad to be surrounded by people this evening, I'm sure. Uh, but I was floored by the filmmaking talent at work here and the very poignant statement that Tim makes about the state of America today. I was equally floored by the raw emotional and physical performances of actors Jamie Bell, Frank Grillo, and Margaret Qualley. They are all here tonight for an introduction and an extended Q&A. After this plan. So I hope you can all stick around for that. But now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage the director of Donnybrook, Tim Sutton. Reception. I'm just going to take a second to gather myself. <laughs> it's not every day you get to, to be the opening night film of Platform and TIFF and to the Toronto Film Festival and to especially the, uh, the programmers. Thank you so much. It's an honor. <laughs> so uh, a couple quick thank yous. I'd, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Backup Media. Uh, Joel Dibu and David Atlan Jackson for being such great partners. To my producers, David Lancaster, Stephanie Wilcox, you delivered every step of the way, and I appreciate that. <laughs> to Scott Barnado in the Rumble office, he did a lot of the dirty work that doesn't go recognized, so thank you. Uh, to Nick Shoemaker of UTA and uh, my lawyer, Andre Desrochers, thank you so much for your patience and for your guidance during the entire process. Well, there's a balcony, too. That's incredible. Um, uh, most importantly, I have to thank my incredible cast, which I'd like you to meet. Uh, first off, Jamie Bell. The lovely Margaret Qualley. <laughs> and the unstoppable Frank Grillo. <laughs> I, I, I want to leave you with this. This film is a dark film, and we found a lot of darkness there at the end of the river. And it was almost too dark to see, but within that darkness, there was great, great beauty. And I hope the film speaks to you. Thank you very much. So, uh, not to waste your time, thank you for staying for the Q&A, which I think the film uh, does well with. Um, let's bring in Jamie Bell. Give us a drink. Margaret Qualley. And Frank Hill. Uh, Frank will be here in a minute. He, he needs to collect himself. He just saw the movie for the first time. <laughs> Nice dramatic welcome when he comes out to join us. Um, so I think I'd like to just start off by talking a bit about what this film was like for you to make, Tim. It was, it's a very different film than the films you've made previously um, in terms of scale and, and everything, although it does return to some similar themes from your previous work, so maybe you could talk a little bit about the experience in general. Um, well, uh, it, it, importantly, it, it's a lot like my other, my smaller films in that it deals with people in their environment, um, whether that's a physical environment, emotional environment, uh, political environment, and uh, and it just sees how they how they move around in that space. I think what sets this movie apart. Sorry. I think what sets this movie apart is the. First of all, the scale. Uh, second of all, the performances, the characters you really, you really get to know and you really get attached to. 
Um, but but also that it's it's the act of violence. There's no there's no threat of violence. There's no uh, wondering if there's going to be violence. It is violence, and I figured uh, it was important to not skirt around that, but to attack it as as if it were my home territory. Um, and uh, you know, for me, this film, uh, as I think I mentioned in the introduction, what it what it signifies to me is really a metaphor. Uh, for a very, you know, an America suffering from some form of PTSD itself, and you have, um, you know, this question of whether it can recover and whether there is hope left and whether these characters can achieve it or if they're too far gone. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what you think about that. And, and I know this was adapted from a, a book, so maybe you can talk a little bit about what the message means to you. Sure. Well, first of all, the, the, it's an adaptation of a book called Donnybrook by a great author named Frank Bill. Uh, and it played, yeah, very, a, great, a great writer. Um, and it provides a great base for this film in that it's, it, it's very, the, the environment is very rich, the language is very rich, and the characters are introduced in a way that is, brutality is on the first page. It's on the first paragraph. It's in the first sentence. So you have to then be up to that challenge. I think what, what, what I wanted to do with this was make it a larger film about not only families and not only a, a part of the country, but in a way about the, the kind of soul of the country that we're in right now. I mean, it's, we all know it's dark times in America and that calls for a, a dark film that tries to at least, um, at least crawl around in it and, and see what it feels like. Um, for the people in this film, and, and, and I think in, the, in a lot of ways for the people uh, who are struggling in America right now. Um, I know that, that you mentioned a few times the very violent nature of um, some parts of the film. I know there was um, some questions about like how far to go in certain instances, and um, I, I mentioned to you the other day that I really liked the way the death of the son was handled and the way that you shot that. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about your choices and how to portray the violence in some cases. I, I think it's important that the son dies. Uh, I think that's a horrifying thing to say, but as a writer and as a, as a director, what, what my goal is is to do the things that scare me most, that worry me most, and to, and to try and illustrate them, try and learn from them, uh, put myself in that position. You know, some violence has to be bloody and some has to be poignant um, visually, and some needs to only to be suggested. So I think, and I and you, David and Stephanie, my producers, were, were helped talk me through how much to show and how little to show. But I think the most important thing is at that point in the movie, uh, all you need to do is see Frank's face, and and you, and you just you gasp. Um, and I thought it was important to make the, make the movements of the camera and the sounds as ambient and as artful and as smooth as possible because uh, it's like, at that point, Frank is not a human being, he's the devil. I, I mean, that gets better than that's what it feels like. Um, I think that's a good segue to Margaret, actually, because if he's the devil, maybe she's an angel of sorts. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how you prepared for this role and what, you know, it meant to, to work with him on this project. I feel so lucky to have been able to work with him. I think he's just the greatest. And, um, no, yeah, I, um, I don't know, Delia was really special to me and I think despite the fact that she's in really horrible, horrible circumstances, she is so beautiful and, and angelic and powerful and strong and all those things. So. It was um, really, uh, really awesome to be able to play her and then to, to work with and these guys. Um, your character is so expressive in the film and doesn't often have much dialogue, but it's a very physical, beautiful, raw performance, and I'm wondering how Tim helped to get that out of you and what the approach to some of those difficult scenes was. Um, I think one of the most exciting parts about working with him was just that he really didn't draw any boundaries and it was open to whatever happened on the day. Like obviously, it, you know, the script for starters was really, 
was really phenomenal and he's such a talented writer, but then he was open and, 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 and kind of relished in spontaneity and uh, um, so that made him, you know, he's coming to set really exciting and a little scary, but really exciting. Um, I think for Jamie and Frank, your characters, I think both represent opposing, you know, opposing things, one being, you know, ultimately hopeful and the other being maybe evil that can not be, um, you know, turned back. And I'm wondering if you could each talk a little bit about how you approach these characters and, um, you know, how you prepare for them and what they meant to you. I mean, what I love about John is that he, uh, there's a nobleness to him, um, which I hadn't really seen in a lot of characters, at least, uh, nobleness in this way, you know, he, he's kind of, he's come into this family that isn't his own. He's raising his children that aren't his own. Um, this woman that he loves, even through all of her flaws, is kind of crippling the family, but he loves her regardless. Um, you know, he's an ex-serviceman, so he understands violence and, um, you know, he's part of this kind of forgotten society. Um, and there's a, there's a desperation to him, there's a desperate need to alter his circumstances and the only way that he thinks he can do that is through violence. That's what he knows, that's what he's good at. Um, I, just, I just love the idea of a character who puts his life on the line to save his family. I just think it's a really beautiful idea. Even though, you know, at times he, he grapples with morality and, and, um, and the law and authority, um, I think ultimately there is a good heart in there. I think, I think that's what Tim does very well, is he finds heart and soul and and beauty where there really shouldn't be any at all. Um, and that's what I really love about the, the film. Um, Frank, maybe you can take that one too and talk a bit about your preparation and approach for the character. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't pleasant. Um, you know, the, the sad reality is we don't have to look very far to, to see evil. I was just in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm making a movie there. And yesterday, I, uh, my apartment was about 500 feet from the bank where a guy walked in and just started shooting people. And he killed three people. And then eventually they shot him. This was on my way to the airport to come here. And uh, the result of it was that he didn't work there or anything. He just walked in there with 100 rounds, 100 mags, and just started shooting people. And that's evil. And that's what I think, there's a guy who lost hope. And I think that's, to me, what it represents. Especially in our country, where there's, this was running rampant, it's almost pandemic, that people kill each other like this, with, uh, with no sense of, of sympathy or empathy. And I think that's where the character had gotten to a point when you meet him in the movie. And uh, I really believe in, in my heart of hearts, at the end, he wants to die, that, that he died fast, if you notice. He, he went down and kind of gave up almost. I mean, no, no offense to you. <laughs> you, were, you were very masculine in the movie. But, should be told, he, he got me kind of quickly. Uh, so, so, to that, I believe, and it, 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 you know, again, Tim, the sparsity of the words is brilliant. And you're right, by the time you see me in the coat, and the, it, you know someone's dying. And uh, uh, it, it's, I, I just saw the movie for the first time, and I'm, I'm a little shaky, so. Um, the, the last scene, uh, or one of the last scenes, when you, when you finally reach the, the Donnybrook and the fighting, um, we talked earlier about how important it was for, for, you know, how that was choreographed, or maybe a lack of choreography. Maybe you could talk a bit about the decisions behind how that came to be. I, you know, my films in the past have been very ambient and ephemeral, and, uh, and I had never done fighting or stunts in, in any way. So it, it was a real challenge for me, but it was at the same time very exciting. I went at it knowing that if the first 30 seconds of the fight weren't real, weren't scary, weren't like you have to duck your head into your arms because it's so horrible, then the film as a whole will fail. Um, so, you know, at first the stunt coordinators were showing me like, what about this backflip chop move? And I showed them these, these YouTube videos. They did a tremendous job, by the way, but, but we worked together. I showed them these YouTube videos of Russian gangs fighting in the outskirts of Moscow. 
it's just 20 on 20 and they just get near each other and then it becomes one thing, like one form of these people just beating each other to death. It's horrifying. And I said, that's what it needs to look at. So let's strip everything down. Let's take away what everybody knows of, as far as different styles of fighting and let's, and let's just try and kill each other. And then they, they went away and developed a, a choreography that, that answered that, you know, that call and did a fantastic job. I mean, Jamie and Frank, you know, Frank is an expert fighter, but even he had to kind of strip down what he usually does or what a lot of his knowledge and, and just kind of go just from the gut. But I want to say something about that. The most important part of the fight is not the fight. It's the, it's the national anthem. It's the national anthem. It's, you're, you're looking at these, you're hearing the land of the free, and you're looking at a bunch of men in a, in a cage with fires in the background, and they're all there to kill each other. And it feels like that, that to me, defines the film and defines its place in the country right now. Um, yeah. of you guys, I just want to ask about the importance of the physical locations in the film. Um, you, landscape and the characters' interaction with them, I think, is very important, and uh, you know, in, in all senses of that word. And it has been in your previous work as well. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about just the setting. Well, sure. The book is set in Indiana, and we shot in Ohio, which is right next to Indiana. But most importantly, we shot on the river, and the river was the most important part of the landscape to me because it. it Jamie and I talked about the comparisons of this film to Apocalypse Now, which is a masterpiece, and this film is not, but we can all have dreams. <laughs> but, but about Willard going up the river and coming to the Donnybrook, it, it, it's, it's, he's coming to the end of the world. He's coming to a different place. He's coming to uh, where the laws don't apply, where, where nothing, um, nothing good is going to come. That when you win, when you do your job, you will never... You won't, no one survives truly the Donny Brook. Technically, we used uh, wide lenses so we could see everything the entire time, the kind of vastness of the, of the kind of barren landscape. And then at, by the time you get all the way to the Donny Brook, all you see is this cage and you know you're never going to get out. The, how you develop the visual style with your DP. And then because the film is so visual and feels very lived in and is more a series of moments, if each of you on stage. Um, Jamie, Margaret, and Frank, if you could talk a bit about what it was like to perform in, in that sort of structure. Great. The, the cinematographer's name is David Ungaro. He's the youngest person to ever be admitted to the French Society of Cinematographers, which is a real honor. Uh, I, I, we hired him, David, Stephanie, and I hired him because of his work on A Prayer Before Dawn, which unfortunately you will not see because it came and went very quickly, but it's this incredible film about a Thai prison and boxing in a Thai prison. So we knew that he could make up for my weak points, which was, I don't know how to film fighting, show me how to film fighting. And then what was important was to develop this language somewhere, we had fighting on one side, we had the kind of quiet intimacy of moments with like Margaret and Jamie that I, I knew very much how to do. And we kind of wrapped that together with um, our main influence uh, with our visual style was Sicario that movie Sicario, if you've seen it, um, to move around exploring things, but not constantly, but only when it matters. Yeah, I, I mean, there's an incredible uh, looseness uh, to Tim's work and what he allows you to do. I mean, he wrote a beautiful script that was really all there on the page, but he, what he allows for is, is just um, behavior. An actor to just, just be the behavior of the person and not necessarily say anything, not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily part of the scene as written, but he just allows you that time and that space to, to do that stuff. I mean, it, I guess a lot of that in there is, is stuff that probably isn't written, is stuff that, you know, we just find. I mean, the, all those kids in the movie, both of those kids are non actors, they've never worked before this movie, so there was a lot of time where I would be distracting them. And I, would, I could see that, I, like I had them kind of under this little spell, and then I'd tell Tim, like, just, just start rolling the camera. And we just wouldn't tell him that we were doing stuff. And um, I love that. I love, I love when, um, I find kind of being action as something very kind of, maybe it kind of scares me a bit. 
So I like the blurred edge between real life and the performance, and the more that you can blur that edge and get rid of that, I feel very comfortable in that arena, and Tim, I think, allowed us all to, to kind of be in that place a lot of the time. Um, no, yeah, I mean, to, to add on to that, I sometimes feel like when I have ideas on a set or something that, like, uh, a director will sort of placate me and be like, sure, yeah, you can do that once. And, um, and, and Tim wasn't that way at all. Not that, you know, he was just really ex excited about different ideas and collaborating with someone that way is really fun. Like, you know, even the, and having to actually make it to the movie, like, I feel like a lot of times when I've done something strange, it's not going to be in the movie. But then, um, like this, you know, like standing on the car or whatever it was, all those sort of weird things that you didn't think were going to happen, and then you all of a sudden did, and then it's in there. It's kind of cool. And Frank, maybe you could touch on a little bit too about you know Tim mentioned how you had to forget about being a being a fighter and trained and all of that, and wondering uh, yeah. how that was like for you. Well, I mean, yeah, for that. Um, you know, the, the, the great Frank Capra said, if you think it, the audience will know it, right? So when you do a piece like this where there are very few words, don't ever get caught not thinking on, on screen. And so you work twice as hard to always behave and make sure that you, you don't get caught blank. I think that's the key to a film like this is to, you, you have to do twice as much homework. Um, and as far as the fighting is concerned, yeah, I mean, I, I know how to fight. I, I grew up fighting. Uh, I, I, Jiu-jitsu and boxing and wrestling and all of it. I know all of it. It's great. Whatever. <laughs> when you do a movie like this, where these aren't trained fighters, these are, you know, these are, these are guys fighting for their lives, you have got to forget all of that and not look so polished, which is tough, which is learning another language almost, which is going back to not knowing how to look good, uh, how to look right. And it's, you know, it's like a hockey fight more than anything. Uh, so it's, it, it's difficult. And listen, when you do a movie of this size, you don't have a lot of rehearsal time. You, you know, you don't have a lot of uh, takes. And uh, it's, it becomes a free-for-all. And that's, I think, and I have to tell you, I, I just, uh, you, you, watching it for the first time, you did a terrific job in that cage. I mean, I would never know. Yeah, bro, really, really, great. Really, 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 really. So, I mean, you know, he's a dancer. <laughs> I mean, I can't give you a compliment and not take something. <laughs> As far as performances go and, and the compliments I'm getting as far as like giving people room for behavior, you have to work with uh, actors who want that room and who want to go as deep as they possibly can and there's, there's a lack of that, frankly, in, in our industry. There's a lot of people who don't want to play characters with flaws or they don't want to take giant risks. I mean, the risks Margaret takes alone in this movie would scare uh, most actresses away, but yet she comes, she, yeah. What she does with them is she doesn't just accomplish them, she turns them into attributes. She, she turns these risks into something that you, that you think she absolutely should do. And you believe in her. And it's only because she's not doing it by the book and she's kind of forcing me to open, open the character up and open the space up, rather than the other way around. So I, I feel like you have to have people who... I just want to go all the way. Like that's all my filmmaking is. I just want to go all the way. And you're sitting, I'm sitting next to three people who feel the same way. How do you keep growing as an actor? He mentioned that you started off in, uh, from what most people know, is Billy Elliot. Yeah, dancing already referenced. Um, and so, how do you, how do you come to be in a film like this? And, and how do you keep growing? And then for Tim. Uh, if you could maybe just talk a little bit more about the contrast between working with non-professional actors as you've done in your previous films and these guys. Yeah, gee, um, you know, I've been very fortunate really to work with some really good people um, and I got very lucky first time out, which is, you know, is a curse and, and a blessing and um, challenging to deal with at like such an early age, you know. If I went back to school after that and, and, uh, and then kind of slowly started making films with Thomas Mitterberg and David Gordon Green, um, just real experiences where I went at like 
packed the bag and went onto a set and went, I have no idea um, how to do this or what I'm doing. Um, but I realized I don't think that really goes away fully because I step onto sets now and I feel like I really, I don't know how I've gotten here. I don't know how, how to uh, approach this. Um, and, and, and usually, you know, it's, it's the tormented thing where you, you drive away from set every day and you go, don't worry, I'll get it tomorrow. I'll hit it hard tomorrow, I'll get it tomorrow, you know. And that's my relationship with it every time. I do feel that you have experiences which are, which challenge you in ways that you feel prepared for. And that's certainly that's what I felt on this because I felt I wanted to ch push the boat out a little further than I usually would do. But that's only because I was given the room to feel comfortable to do that. So um, I've just been very fortunate with the people that I've had around me. You know, I've had the same manager for almost 20 years, same agent for 20 years. Um, I think that matters because they care about you. Um, and if I felt very kind of taken care of um, throughout my career, really. Um, the transition from working with non-actors to actors. Um, it was, it was uh, something that I worried about. I worried if anyone would listen to me on set, which made me a little nervous. Um, working with non-actors, if you notice, Dark Knight is very much an observational movie as is Pavilion, as is Memphis. The camera is set in a very specific place, and what, between action and cut, it's all up to them. Because you can't have a non-actor deliver lines, because they're non-actors. You can't have a non-actor pretend they're a great actor, or you'll get a pretend performance. So I made those films in a, behind a glass wall, in the, in the manner of like Gus Van Sant, to, to watch and to stay removed. The thing that those movies lacked, now that I look back at them, I think I, I love them like babies. But they lack emotion, and they lack connection. And some people really love a movie that's based solely on images, and some people would walk out and say, no plot, no plot, what the fuck? <laughs> Literally at the premiere at South by Southwest. <laughs> um, what, 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 what these actors bring, and what other actors bring, Dara J. Tiller is in the audience, she, she played the Tammy. And, and the performances, the, the performances of her and, and, other, and other actors in this film, uh, they can deliver performance, not just modeling, and you know, Brisson calls actors models, because they, he, they do as little as possible for him. This time I was able to roll the camera and watch people come alive in ways that I, I couldn't have directed, I couldn't have thought of. And so they take a performance and, and they ground it and they take it further and that gets you excited thinking, oh God, this next scene, what do you think I can do now? Instead of more knowing what the blueprint is going to be. I mean, Donnie Book comes alive on so many different levels because the performers are able to do what they do. Um, I would have to agree. Thank you so much for coming. Congratulations on the film. Thank you. Thank you.